distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this policy conversation on strengthening regional cooperation for community and infrastructure resilience in the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is highly disaster prone. We have been witnessing an increase in the frequency and intensity of hazards such as heat waves, floods and cyclones. At the same time, the region is undergoing rapid infrastructure transitions. In this session, we will share experiences and present perspectives on building climate and disaster resilience infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific. I am delighted to invite the moderator, Mr. Abraham Simpson. Mr. Simpson is a disaster resilience infrastructure specialist with the Pacific Advisory Team to CDRI. He has more than four decades of experience in the Pacific Islands across power, water, land transport, and shipping. For 15 years, he served as CEO of Power Utilities, as well as those utilities that look at water. He's also operated a private shipping company. Over to you, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Abraham Simpson. I'm currently moderating from Fiji, so it's quite late at night here. Um, um, I, uh, I'm currently working with the Pacific Power Association also, assisting the Pacific Island Power Utilities with their response to climate change and improving resilience of their infrastructure. I've been working with and assisting the CDRI initiative, our IRIS initiative during this important interim setup period. And I'm currently assisting the IRIS team as the Pacific hub and the project management unit is developed. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Um, we have on the panel for this session, experts from Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. Um, we have Mr. Jamie Espista. Uh, he may log in later, so although he's um, uh, scheduled as the first presenter, we may have to shift him back. Uh, He's the Australian Ambassador for the Environment for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We have also um, Mr. Kamal Kishore. He's a member secretary for the National Disaster Management Authority, Government of India, and the Indian co-chair of CDRI's executive committee. We have Professor Minio uh, Takea is the Distinguished Technical Advisor on Disaster Risk Reduction with JICA, the Visiting Professor of Tohoku University. And the final speaker is uh, Anjali Kaur. Ms. Anjali Kaur is the Deputy Assistant Administrator, USAID, Asian Bureau. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, and thank each of them for making themselves available to share their ex expertise and experience with us uh, during this session. Now, for each of this session, I will introduce each panelist before they make a 10-minute presentation. We shall then have uh, a question and answer session. Mm -hmm. So please keep your questions uh, for that uh, time, or you may um, enter in the questions in the chat box or comments. Following this session, uh, there will, uh, following the question and answer session, there will be a two-minute video on the U.S.-Australian MECON Safeguard Program, following which I shall wrap up this session. Thank you. Um, May I ask, is Jamie Ibista with us? 
it doesn't look like he's with us at yet, as yet. So he was the first uh, speaker. I shall therefore um, uh, go to the second speaker, Mr. Kishore, Kamal Kishore. Um, is he with us? Yes, very much. Okay, thank Delhi. you. Let me let me introduce you. Uh, Mr. Kamal Kishore is a member of the National Disaster Management Authority uh, of India and the uh, Indian co-chair of Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure Executive Committee. He has worked on disaster risk reduction and recovery issues since 1992 at the local, national and regional and global levels. Prior to joining NDMA, he worked with the United Nations Development Program for nearly 13 years in New Delhi, Geneva, and New York. At the UNDP headquarters, he led global advocacy campaigns to address disaster risk reduction, concerns in the UN's national development goals and the post-2015 development agenda. As, as a program advisor, he led the development of disaster and climate risk management related elements of the UNDP strategic plan 2014 to 17. Mr. Kishore holds a bachelor degree in architect from the Indian Institute of Technology, Ruki, and a master's degree in urban planning, land and housing development from the Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok. Mr. Kishore shall be highlighting the role of CDA RI and India in promoting infrastructure resilience in the Indo-Pacific region. Mr. Kishore. Thank you very much, uh, Abraham. In this uh, hybrid uh, conference, I am the only speaker here on stage in mm -hmm. New Delhi, uh, feeling quite lonely. I wish, uh, you know, the, the remaining speakers were alongside me and the stage uh, looked a little bit more full. But what you don't see on the camera is a very eager audience and very supportive audience. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm lonely only on the stage, not in the studio. Uh, so um, this is a very important area uh, to, promote Indo uh, to promote disaster and climate resilience in, um, in um, Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I want to highlight three areas, you know, which are of concern to, uh, I can say, uh, on behalf of Government of India, uh, but also for CDRI. So uh, before uh, the first one, I, uh, before I sort of explain the first area, I just want uh, us to think about what really happened in Tonga uh, not so long ago. Uh, we had. Uh, a major volcanic eruption uh, for a long time you know i i have you know in my professional network uh, people i know who've been working in tonga including colleagues from the asian development bank but for a significant length of time there was no communication because there was disruption in communication channels under sea there was uh, issues related to power supply there was issues related to water uh, huge amounts of water was transported, and now we have a problem of, you know, empty plastic water bottles in a small island country. So, uh, you know, how quickly, you know, a significant disaster can overwhelm uh, a small island developing state is really illustrated by what happened in Tonga. Despite the world's best intention to provide quick, uh, relevant, uh, support to, to Tonga for the first few days, very little was possible to be done. You know, it was very difficult to work there. So, which basically highlights to me that, especially for uh, small island developing states in that region and in other regions as well, we really carefully have to work towards not just modeling risk, but also looking at what is the reasonable worst case scenario we should be preparing for. In some senses, what happened in Tonga is a preview of what could happen in other small island developing states. Just imagine in a couple of decades, if the sea level is higher by 20 centimeters, there's a tsunami 
uh, you know, the sea level, the baseline uh, sea level has already risen. There's a tsunami, and it coincides with a few other hazards. And you have a really catastrophic uh, event which can wipe out uh, the country's uh, economies almost 100%. Or as it is, you know, if you look at Cyclone Winston, I believe, in Fiji, it wiped out one single event. 32% of the country's GDP was wiped out. So what, it, what that means is that for small island developing states, we really have to think about redundancies in a very different way. You know, our ability to absorb the shocks is going to be very, very low. So how do we sort of reimagine the kind of uh, resilience building efforts we need to do in, in small island developing states, which go beyond the traditional practice of um, building resilience. So I think what I, so in essence, what I'm trying to say is look at redundancies for protecting small island developing states in that region in a different way. I think uh, Tonga emergency is still very much on, but it is important that we draw the right lessons from it and incorporate it in what we uh, do in the future. My second point is that a lot of uh, countries, a number of countries, including SIDS themselves, are making large investments in infrastructure in uh, the small island developing states. You know, uh, this morning, uh, Prime Minister Morrison's remarks uh, highlighted that Australia has, for example, a $3 billion investment in building infrastructure in the Pacific Island countries. So how do we get that investment right? How do we make sure that it is done in a resilient way? For CDRI, that is the niche. How can we support that with the right kind of technical assistance and do that in a manner which is really working alongside our colleagues from small island developing states. It's not really providing them support as such, you know, the classic tech transfer. It's more accompanying them in their journey towards resilience, which will include a very different kinds of approaches, not just, you know, parachuting in experts, you know, who develop good analysis, but then they come back and there isn't enough absorptive capacity in, the, in those countries to actually use that. Instead of that, can we have an approach which, is, which emphasizes peer learning, which emphasizes working alongside the institutions in SIDS in getting, uh, getting these things right so that investments that are happening in these countries uh, actually lead to resilience. Uh, we do not invest in risk, we invest in resilience. The third thing is uh, specifically about connectivity. Uh, we have to recognize that a large number of countries in the Indo-Pacific region uh, still, re still rely on limited connectivity. Also, connectivity is the key to economic prosperity, getting integrated fully in the global economic system, having access to markets, but all of that is going to be at risk. So how do we reimagine connectivity in a manner? It sort of links back to my first point as well, that you know, in coming up with connectivity, many small island developing states, you know, they have one airport. Uh, and if that airport goes underwater and, and the jetties are uh, you know, inundated as well, basically they are stranded. Uh, there is no, no redundancy there as well. So how do we look at connectivity infrastructure in a manner? Uh, that it sort of uh, provides a push to economic development, opens up new opportunities uh, for them, and at the same time does it in a sustainable, dependable way so that it actually leads to resilience for those countries, those regions, and communities living in those regions. So that's by way of my initial remarks from here in New Delhi. Thank you, Abram. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Kishore. We um, thank you for your insights and uh, appreciate uh, what you've shared. I will now um, 
introduce our second uh, speaker for this session, uh, Mr. Jamie Espista, who has just joined us. Um, Mr. Mr. Espista is Australia's ambassador for the environment. He has over 20 years experience working in the humanitarian, humanitarian and development field. He's the first assistant secretary of the humanitarian NGOs and partnership division at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Prior to this, he was the Minister Councillor Development for Africa based in Pretoria and Assistant Director General for the Africa and Middle East branch of AusAid. He was, he was also the human, humanitarian coordinator for the Australian government between January 2009 and to October 2010. Before joining the government, Jamie uh, worked in a range of, of international policy and development uh, positions with NGOs, including the International Program Directorate uh, programs director for Caritas International Network in RK following the Asian tsunami. In the late 1990s, Jamie worked in the Asia Pacific region, particularly in Cambodia, Burma, Thailand, and Thailand on refugee policy and internal displaced issues. Mr. Espista shall be highlighting the role of Australia in promoting infrastructure res resilience in the Indo Pacific. Pacific region. I shall now hand it over to him. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. And uh, uh, it's uh, great to see uh, some familiar faces on, on the line. And, and Kamal, it's, uh, it would be nice to be sitting with you uh, as well on, uh, in, in uh, India as part of the, uh, the panel. But it is second best to be able to be together uh, virtually. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, the CDRI and others in, in hosting this important uh, uh, conference and, and forum. Um, good afternoon, evening to, to delegates. Um, I'm delighted to said to be part of this um, uh, and to be able to be at this international conference for Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Um, Australia is pleased to be a partner with CDRI and, and one of the key member countries and considering how we can collaborate to strengthen infrastructure resilience within the Indo-Pacific region. We're clearly in a new era of disaster risk management. We're facing increasingly complex and interconnected challenges. We're grappling with the health, the economic and the social shocks of COVID-19, while also dealing with the increasing challenges of climate change and conflict-related disruptions. We also in the Indo-Pacific live in one of the most disaster regions in the world. Uh, more than 10 of the 15 um, most disaster prone countries are, are in this region and particularly most at risk from natural hazards and the effects of climate change. For Australia, it is very much our neighbourhood and we are certainly not immune to the increasing challenges that we face from climate change. And we've recently dealt with the significant impacts of flooding and bushfires on, bushfires on a large scale. Between 2000 and 2018, economic damage to developing countries in Asia ranged from 1% to 6% of their GDP. In the Pacific, as Kamal mentioned, where we increasingly small island states are dealing with these impacts, before COVID, disasters on average affected more than 11% of people um, per annum. Vanuatu, Tonga and Palau are particularly vulnerable with the estimated annual average economic losses amounting to 21% to 18 and 12% of GDP respectively. The cost of infrastructure damage alone in the Pacific region has been quantified at more than $2 billion over the past decade. And it's not just the physical damage, as we're all aware, it's also the impacts it has on setting back development gains and the impacts it has on societies and cultures. To effectively manage the risks of disasters, a dramatic shift is needed to look at how we ensure a more collective focus on investing in risk reduction and risk-informed development. In particular, there is a need for concerted action to ensure that infrastructure is increasingly disaster and climate resilient. At the front end of the design, the planning and the implementation, we're looking at what the science is telling us and how infrastructure is going to have to be able to be better 
able to deal with and prevent the loss of life, protect people, investments, and human, human uh, uh, society and cultures. The increased loss of life from destruction of assets due to poor risk governance and current infrastructure decisions is going to continue and increasingly impact on economies of the region. The opportunities and financial benefits of its building resilience into infrastructure investments has been highlighted recently by the OECD, the World Bank, the ADB and CDRI. And the cost of not doing so is increasingly evident. Beyond what we're doing in our region, Australia is committed to work with other partners and countries globally. But again, through the CDRI, how we can particularly work with our Indo-Pacific partners and improve climate and disaster resilience. We're working with many partners, including with, I know, Japan, who's on the line with the US and with India, to look at how we can meet our commitments through the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction and working together to ensure all voices are heard in disaster risk reduction and climate action, including the voices of women and girls, people with disabilities, the elderly, the ind Indigenous people and youth. At COP26, Australia doubled our climate financing to $2 billion. And it was particularly fo increased our focus on adaptation and resilience. Within this two billion, over 700 billion will focus within the Pacific region and 70% of our climate financing bilaterally and regionally is focused on climate resilience and adaptation, which was a strong call that came out of COP26. In February this year, the foreign ministers of India, Japan and the US came together and committed to practical cooperation to address regional challenges, including how we work together on humanitarian assistance and disaster response, how we can support our Indo-Pacific neighbours to build more climate and disaster really resilient infrastructure, as mentioned. This is something which in Australia domestically, we're looking at how we increasingly address. We're working through mechanisms such as a partnership for infrastructure in Southeast Asia and the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific. Australia's long history of planning, developing, procuring and maintaining quality infrastructure in Southeast Asia is something that demonstrates how we want to continue to develop and enhance the high standards and accountability on how we can collectively work with countries to deliver effective, long-term, sustainable infrastructure. The Khao Lan Bridge and the Tuan Bridges in Vietnam and the Thai Lao Friendship Bridge are two exam three examples of these particular uh, investments that we've worked together with countries in our region. As the region experiences and its needs have evolved, so too has Australia's approach. We've transformed our partnerships from directly funding major infrastructure projects to becoming a trusted advisor that partners with regional governments to enhance the infrastructure and governance outcomes. It's increasingly clear that it's not just about the investment of financing, and it's not just about how we work together, but it's about ensuring the governance arrangements with national governments, with private sector and local communities are able to not only ensure the construction of infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, but it's ongoing maintenance and sustainability. As a founding executive member of the Indian-led Co Coalition for Disaster Resil Resilient Infrastructure, we are committed to deepening CDRI's engagement in the Pacific. We're closely looking at engaged in establishing the infrastructure for resilient island states initiative, IRIS. And Australia has been pleased to contribute an initial $10 million to the IRIS initiative, joining India, UK, Fiji, Jamaica, and Mauritius in launching this at COP26. The initiative as mentioned uh, by Kamal aims to empower small island states communities to build activities and for them to have a key role in their long-term resilient um, uh, future. In the Pacific, we value this initiative because it will bring high quality technical collaboration between different countries and different community organisations. We're actively working with the IRIS team to assist in standing up the proposed Pacific Regional Hub and the IRIS Project Management Unit. And we welcome the involvement of other CDRI members in these increasing efforts. The recent appointment of a lead technical specialist will be key in progressing a number of these things. And to be honest, it's been a real credit to India and others 
that have once this was announced six just under six months ago really accelerating the practical partnerships Australia will continue to work and deploy technical expertise to partner on this as we go forward in the coming um, the coming year. Finally, we've talked about the importance of infrastructure, but I just want to finish on the role markets have and how we in, ensure that local private sector markets can be a key part of building resilience in small island states. Australia in the, has developed now markets for change program in Fiji which works with um, uh, women with people with disabilities to support countries to enhance resilience and effectiveness of community planning uh, in market recovery following crises. This was particularly critical following the extensive cyclone damage from Raki Raki in Fiji, which, which now has a, a Category 5 cyclone resilient municipal market, together with a rural women's accommodation centre and a resource training centre which is critical for people with disabilities. Women comprise 75 to 90% of market vendors in the Pacific, and their voices are critical in this developing this infrastructure um, development. Australia is pleased to be working cooperatively with CDRI members to strengthen the resilient infrastructure systems and communities in the Pacific. We look forward to the success of the IRS initiative and to the next opportunity to engage with many of you here and the forthcoming Asia-Pacific Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which Australia, together with some of our Pacific partners and others, will be hosting in Brisbane, Australia, in September this year. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here today to highlight the opportunities for us to strengthen collaboration in resilient infrastructure and recovery from a crisis, and I look forward to any follow-up questions. Again, many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Espista. And we uh, really appreciate Australia's help, especially in the Pacific and the Asian region. Um, our, sec our third speaker um, for this session is, Mr. Uh, is Professor Kimio Akea. Professor is well known as Reduction and Risk Construction Policy Advisor. He joined the PDNA Survey and Recovery Policy Dialogue around the world's mega disasters such as the Sumatra Tsunami 2004, Central Java Earthquake 2006, Manila Ondo Flood 2009, Pakistani Indus Flood 2010, Thailand Flood 2011, Philippine Typhoon Yolanda 2013, the Nepal Earthquake 2015, and uh, many others, uh, disasters. The concept word Build Back Better, standardizing the Sendai framework was proposed by him from the 2006 Central Java earthquake and first documented on the PDNA of the Manila Ondo flood 2007. Played a significant role as a member of, Japanese, of the Japanese government's negotiating team towards the formulation of the Sendai framework for the DRR 2015 to 2030, and made Build Back Better and as an international standard of recovery concept. This continuously contributes to the Sendai framework, uh, indicator finalizing process as an open-ended expert group member. He's the sole distinguished technical advisor on DRR of JICA. Professor Takia, Takeya's Hi. presentation shall highlight the world disaster damage potential for future hazards, including climate change effect and the importance of reducing damage to critical infrastructure and economic damage as laid in the UN Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Mr. Takeya. Okay, thank you. Takeya. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes, we Let's can go. see it. Uh, I, I want to make the contents. Uh, the world disaster damage potential for the future hazard will increase year by year, including climate change effects, that all of you know. And the UN Center Frame for DRR revealed the importance to reduce the damage of critical infrastructure and economic damage, uh, monitoring by the outcome target uh, of our effort. And what kind of initiative will be needed to achieve these targets? And 
hint for the target collaboration and strategic collaboration to strengthen infrastructure resilience within the Indo-Pacific region. Already Kamal Kishotan uh, initialized just after the center meeting. So center framework, let's back to once again. Uh, we know, uh, but the priority number one and number two, number three is investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience. And one more thing is, unfortunately, just uh, disaster happen. Let's build back better, not uh, get the same damage again uh, and recovery uh, through the build back better concept. This is a concept of the Sendai framework, as you already know. And we decided uh, three input target and four outcome target. And mortality affected people, damage to critical infrastructure, economic loss. These four outcome outcome target must be reduced and the free input, uh, input target must, must be increased. So most important thing is uh, we believe economic loss, but the, uh, on the same time, uh, reduce the damage to the critical infrastructure is also important. And it, what is the definition of critical infrastructure? We already defined uh, through the UN General Assembly open-ended uh, open -ended expert group that critical infrastructure, uh, that means uh, the physical structures, facilities, networks, and other assets, which provide uh, services that are essential to the social and economic functioning of a community or society. We already defined what is the critical infrastructure. And based on this definition, when we, we discuss infra, we must make clear the type of infrastructure, what we want to discuss. One is disaster risk reduction infra, which protect inclusively states from disaster like river embankment, which protect from flood. And one more thing, most important infra, which lead and maintain society like prime minister office function, DRR agencies functions, police stations, hostel stations, this is another layer. And the third layer is important infra, which maintain society's life to survive. Uh, for example, lifeline, water supply, main road, hospital, and fire station, and so on. And infra, which can be the emergency shelter, like school and city hall, and then private houses. And so the road allocation among stakeholders depends on the hazard type. For example, flood. Area, uh, flood is area-wide hazard but limited along the river depends on the natural condition and the prevention measure. And the drinking water, for example, a lifeline, water resource plant, artificial uh, purification system like bulk water resource plant, delivering and toll collection, every system, quite a systematic issue. So government role and the private sector role and the citizen community role is quite different between each uh, infrastructure. So how about the Asia Pacific development countries. For example, this is a number of disaster. Of course, as you know, uh, disaster is increasing, but how about the damage? So world disaster death is decreasing, uh, fortunately, uh, and affected people number is decreasing, fortunately, to, but, but, but economic loss is increasing dramatically. So the amount of economic damage caused by disaster shows large larger increase, increase compared with another issue. So based on this concept, uh, damage to, uh, to, to the hazard in the developing country, what type of hazard? Number one is, uh, death number one is flood uh, and storm. And affected people, number one is flood and the second storm and the drought also very seriously huge volume. And the, the, how about the economic damage? Uh, flood, storm, uh, these two items is almost 70% of total damage. So we, we talk, when we talk about the disaster risk direction, we must focus most effective items, especially Japanese government JICA want to focus uh, as a uh, cost benefit ratio or a more, most effective one. But the necessary DR investment to still remain very huge in India 35% needed, and the Indonesia almost 50%, Philippines 70% uh, needed, uh, but still a uh, big amount of money needed. 
And focus for okay. Let's go to more drill down the practical issue. Let's focus to the earthquake. How can be inclusive? That means, for example, most of the school and the buildings, uh, like the developing countries, like this. Once the earthquake happen, pancake crash will happen. So no one can survive. So in the school is vulnerable, catastrophic collapse will happen, then evacuation plan has no sense. Uh, hide under the desk is not enough. But many people say evacuation or, 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 or disaster education is uh, very important. No, 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 no one can survive like this situation. And I will show Japanese earthquake case. This is the magnitude of earthquake we are preparing for. Maybe you cannot understand how big earthquake we can stand alone. And also, the, the, this, this is a real film of 1995 earthquake in Kobe. But you, you found that still building is not collapsed. So this is a, uh, this is a, uh, still we, we found that our Japanese uh, school is not so strong enough. Even in, we, we built very high quality, but we made full scale modeling test to which portion we must strengthen. So this is a government role. So based on this lesson learned, we, after, uh, after the earthquake, we spent uh, 15 years to retrofit almost 100% of the whole school in Japan was earthquake resistant retrofitted already. So this is a risk reduction as a social system. This is a government role. Then we can talk about disaster education or evacuation drill and, and so on. So layer structure for policy priorities, number one layer, DRA infra, government complex, main house, tell. second layer is lifeline, main road, school, we are talking about the infrastructure. And the third layer is school, local business, livelihood facility, and the fourth layer is private house. What we must do, urban plan, land use, retrofit, building code system, and a retrofit the subsidiary system for private houses. There are many, we must think about a structured idea to implement and, and, and also strong government complex. And, and also let's focus for flat case. How can be inclusive? For example, individual self-protection mm, like, a, like a protecting by themselves. Uh, this is one idea, but the uh, only rich people can do so. So leave no one behind, far away from this concept. So how about for government public investment, DR investment should reserve a system in the upstream by the central government and levies built by the central government and the retention area or retention bond uh, keep by the land use plan by the local government. So this is no living area by the land use plan for that even for the future. So this is risk reduction as a social system. So leave no one behind can be achieved inclusively protected by the government initiative. So this is our concept. So Japanese, uh, I will pass, Japanese, Japanese spent, even after the World War II, very poor age, we spent five to 8% of the government budget to DRR for the more than three or four decades and uh, reduce, it dramatically reduced the death number of the flooded uh, area inundation area number. So now today we enjoy prosperity of Tokyo subsystem and, 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 and so on. So it is said $1 uh, pre-disaster investment can save four to seven future uh, opportunity costs and, and, and so on. So let's once again think about in, what is inclusive. That is government role. We are the government, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the government role. So what are the strategic collaboration to strengthen infrastructure resilience like this? Uh, Center Frames already clearly mentioned two phases. Phase one is until 2020, uh, make the local strategy plan to make investment for the future. And now we are in the implementation phase. 
remaining 10 years. So we, Japan, decided to send the initiative uh, 4 billion US dollar support and training 40,000 DR officials uh, for past four years. Then initiative two, uh, we are doing the same thing. We are doing our best effort to make it happen. So ex excellent example, Philippine government uh, dramatically in, uh, increasing the budget for flood control. Like a, like a metropolitan area, we support it and built the floodway. And by this, dramatically reduced the inundation damage. And if, this is a best, uh, excellent success case. So uh, JICA shifting from plan to implement DRA infra, uh, like a flood control project and so on. So uh, which item is most important to increase productive DRA prevention investment and also investment for resilient infra? One is government budget, second capacity to implement, or citizens consensus to do it, or political leadership. So I definitely believe regional co collaboration also needed. So I definitely believe among these five, the political leadership is most important. The one excellent moderate Philippine case. So thank you very much for you. Thank you so much, Professor Takeya. Um, Appreciate your presentation and uh, sharing of experience from Japan and other places of the world. Uh, our final speaker for this session is Ms. Uh, Anjali Kaur. She is an uh, international development professional with uh, comprehensive experience at, at the field, country, and global. Oh, sorry. My apologies here. Anjali Kaur. Um, my, oh, yeah. Uh, sh yes, at the um Ms. Ko is a, was a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, leading the global policy and adv advocacy strategies for the HIV and TB programs. Prior to that, she was the senior director of the Asia Pacific for Malaria, Mal Malaria No More, where she established the Indian office and expanded the organization's work across the region, engaging with governments, private sector, civil society, and media. Ms. Gore was also with UNICEF polio program, where she worked at the country and HQ levels, as well as at the World Bank and the UN FDA. She's a Fulbright scholarship and received a bachelor's and master's degree from John Hopkins University. She shall be highlighting the role of the US in promoting infrastructure resilience in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you, Ms. Kaur. Thank you so much. Um, I'm pleased to be here today with all of you to discuss disaster resilience infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific. And I'm very pleased to be here with my fellow colleagues uh, who have given excellent remarks, and especially Takeya san with his most engaging presentation just now. This is an important topic for me personally, as well as for USAID. USAID Administrator Samantha Power has made it clear that the need for partnership on disaster resilient infrastructure has never been more pressing. That's because, in her words, irreversible harm has already befallen our planet and made climate related disasters unavoidable. Building resilience against these disasters and the other consequences of climate change, which affect all of our countries, requires that we join together in partnership for the sake of the common good. This is why the United States is more committed than ever to our partnership with Australia, India, and Japan, and our fellow Quad member countries. The Quad is leading the charge for quality infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. And as we are committed to the Quad, the US remains committed to the development and sustainability of our partner countries in the Indo-Pacific region. We recognize that this region is disproportionately vulnerable to the consequences of climate change, such as the damage caused by extreme weather to the physical infrastructure that powers lives and keeps economies running. To build the resilience of this infrastructure, 
governments, the private sector, civil society, and the international community must cooperate actively, effectively, and immediately. Helping developing countries build their disaster resilience can reduce losses when disasters strike, sustain growth, and reduce poverty amongst the most vulnerable. But investments into resilience have the greatest impact when they are carefully integrated into the development process. That is, when they're tailored to the specific needs in the context of the countries and communities they affect. Such a spirit of collaboration and partnership to address the most pressing challenges facing the Indo-Pacific region is the basis of the 2022 Indo-Pacific strategy. As President Biden said at the East Asia Summit in October, 2021, we envision an Indo-Pacific that is open, connected, prosperous, and secure, and we're ready to work together with each of you to achieve it. I'd like to take a moment to emphasize the word prosperous because that's where a great deal of our focus lies today. Global prosperity has never been before been more closely linked. The Biden-Harris administration and USAID are committed to driving prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region, and we're already making progress. For instance, in Vietnam, over the past five years, USAID support to government regulators, banks, investors, and private sector developers helped spur solar and wind investments in Vietnam, totaling more than $300 million. Just five years ago, solar energy powered approximately 500 households in Vietnam. In 2020, Vietnam solar industry powered some 11 million households. Solar power now makes up nearly 25% of the country's power capacity, generating new jobs, sustainable energy, and brighter futures. Resilience is the other pillar of the Indo-Pacific strategy I'd like to emphasize today. USAID has pledged to work together with partners and allies to help provide people, communities, institutions, and ecosystems in the Indo-Pacific with the appropriate tools and knowledge to better withstand and recover from shocks like floods, cyclones, and heat waves, all of which have only been exacerbated by global climate change. And of course, resilience and prosperity are intrinsically linked. Again, we're already making excellent progress. For instance, in India, USAID contributes to the government of India's goal of constructing 30 million green, energy efficient and affordable homes in India's urban and rural areas. USAID's partnership of over 20 years with India's green building movement has been crucial in ensuring the success of resilient and sustainable power generation and efficient building operations. Still, as the Indo-Pacific region continues to grow, demand for infrastructure that can withstand the pressures of rapidly changing climate and support growing populations continues to rise. The Biden Harris administration will seek to close the infrastructure gap in the Indo-Pacific through initiatives and partnerships like the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, is an admirable example of countries working together for the common good. Our collaboration as a CDRI will help provide a secure and resilient future for more people in countries of the Indo-Pacific region. As co-chair of the CDRI Governing Council, the US is putting our full weight behind CDRI as a cornerstone of our efforts to build climate and disaster resilient infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific and globally. USAID has committed $9.2 million to strengthen CDRI's ability to implement its strategic priorities. Today, our embedded technical specialists at the CDRI Secretariat are supporting transportation, energy, and telecommunications research, and the CDRI work plan for the 2023 to 2026. And as the newest CDRI co-chair, Administrator Samantha Power intends to further this partnership by extending and diversifying CDRI membership to new partners, deepen engagement with the private sector, and promote gender sensitive and inclusive efforts. The Quad will also remain a critical component of these efforts. Since 2015, the US and our Quad partners have provided more than $48 billion in official finance for infrastructure in the Indo Pacific region. This represents thousands of projects across more than 30 countries in support of rural development, health infrastructure, water supply and sanitation, renewable energy, telecommunications, transportation, and more. Moving forward, our infrastructure partnership will amplify these contributions and catalyze 
additional private sector investments in the region. Further, the Quad Working Groups on Infrastructure and Climate recognize that CDRI provides an important institutional framework for coordinating our efforts to promote infrastructure that is more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Through partnerships at the Quad and CDRI, USAID is promoting the greater participation of communities and mainstreaming of climate change adaptation and with disaster resilience infrastructure in all infrastructure investment decisions. The work is a perfect complement to USAID's new climate strategy, which we released on April 21st. The climate strategy outlines how USAID will transform our own operations to substantially reduce carbon emissions, adapt to the climate crisis and further climate justice to increase the diversity, equity, inclusiveness and accessibility of climate efforts. USAID support for CDRI fits naturally with this strategy and the broader US vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific, a vision that we know our quad partners share. Together, our collaboration would lead to a more secure, prosperous and resilient future for our Indo-Pacific partners. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Ko, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. Now we have, um, We've come to the question and answer sessions. Um, I believe there's someone monitoring the chat. If there are any questions or comments there, uh, I'll open it to the floor for any questions. Or comments. Um, how shall we monitor the questions that come from uh, those who are attending in person there in India? They, they will just speak and I will repeat the question. All right. Thank you. All yes. right. Uh, Mr. Shingo Miyamoto from uh, the mission, the Japanese mission here in India is uh, speaking. Uh, the camera is turning to him, and you will see him. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was, I guess, an honor for me to be here as a part of this um, session, a uh, very important session in my mind. And uh, my question is to uh, Professor Takeyama, and um, I think he was mentioning, um, and I guess showing some examples how these um, priorities that I think we're all aware of was actually translated into policy and implemented in order to actually reduce the damages and loss of life and I guess property that we were experiencing in Japan. And this is a concrete example of how it was actually translated into action and yielded pretty big result, I think. And so my question is, does he have any advice in terms of how this experience can be applied into the cooperation that we're trying to do in the framework of the CDRI? What's his advice to those of us who are trying to replicate this kind of thing in other parts of the world, especially in the context of today's discussion in the um, Pacific Island states or in the Indo-Pacific? Thank you so much. Is that for me? Thank you, Professor. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very fine. much. Uh, thank you very much. Nice question. Uh, ja Japanese cases, of course, uh, we are struggling to natural disaster, but we are doing our best effort to uh, conquer it uh, based on the people's consensus. We are people vote to even mayor, governor, or parliament people. All, more, almost all candidates uh, show one of the pillars is disaster risk reduction or disaster re to build disaster resilient societies. This is one of the promise to the political candidate to get to the past, even mayor, governor, and national parliament members without saying such a kind of uh, DRR consciousness uh, within their policy, 
no one can get a boss. So based, uh, uh, we are a democratic country. So based on the people's willingness, uh, will reflect to the policy makers' decision. And finally, uh, political leader, the leadership is very important. So all, uh, once they lost DRR consciousness in, in Japan, uh, most of the polit political politician will lose his post. So people's, people's uh, willingness is most important. And then uh, looking for the more practical, how to collaborate each other or support, as I shown, Sendai framework already indicate how to do it because uh, making national and local DL and practical plan, we supporting practical plan, including investing plan or master plan or like a, like a, like a project plan. Uh, and the real plan can, must be implemented within remaining 10 years. So we already decided how to do it uh, in the center framework. So just uh, what we need is do it. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Takeya. Uh, and my apologies, we really are running out of time. I will now ask the, uh, um, for the video on the US Australian Mekong Safeguard Program to be shown. Infrastructure is a major driver of economic growth and projects can be built to prevent pollution, crime, waste and other negative effects on biodiversity. Developers can use international standards and practices to reduce hazards, but banks continue to fund projects that don't always closely consider environmental and social impacts. In support of countries meeting these challenges, Australia and the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, are collaborating on the USAID and Australia Mekong Safeguards Program. Australia has a long history of engaging in this special region. We're committed to increasing this engagement. Supporting the development of sustainable infrastructure is key to this. The United States and Australia share mutual goals and close cooperation in priority areas like climate change, sustainable infrastructure, low carbon growth, and the response to the pandemic. USAID is proud to partner with Australia in supporting communities and governments for a more resilient and inclusive Southeast Asia. The program is strengthening environmental and social standards in transportation and energy projects worth over one billion US dollars and complements the US and Australia's efforts to boost economic recovery from COVID-19. Implemented by the Asia Foundation, our program secures sustainable livelihoods and balanced ecosystems by protecting cultural heritage sites, developing tools and resources to foster transparency in decision-making, and ensuring robust standards are applied to projects like Thailand's high-speed railway. Including environmental and social standards in infrastructure planning, builds resilience to climate change while advancing social inclusion and human rights, which contributes to prosperity and sustainability. So this can coexist alongside this. Please contact us at mekong.safeguards at asiafoundation.org to learn more. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone. And uh, unfortunately, we reached this time when we'll have to come to the end of this session. Let me um, let me um, close with uh, a thanks to all of the speakers um, who have uh, made themselves available. It's encouraging, and uh, I could not in three minutes sum up all the <laughs> presentations, but uh, some of the key things have come out is it's encouraging to hear how the developed uh, countries, India, USAID and uh, Australia are putting up a lot of money for the SIDS countries, the small island developing states. And, uh, and not only money, but expertise, knowledge, and uh, there's so much effort going on. And it's uh, 
CDRI is a um, is a uh, effort that uh, that we must uh, that can strengthen this cooperation and sharing of knowledge and effort to maximize the impact of all this investment for the benefit of not only our generation but the future generation. We're expecting more uh, disastrous events, but it's encouraging to see how Professor Takewa shows us graphs how, despite the increase in intensity and disasters that are happening around the world, the deaths are going down and the people affected are going down. That is an encouraging statistics and may it continue onwards <laughs> in, that, in that trend. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you and uh, wish you all the best um, in the uh, section uh, uh, sessions following. Uh, thanks CDRI for organizing this uh, event. And uh, once again from Fiji, Vinaka Thank you.